Hello, everybody. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the we've been doing these hackathons for quite a while, and uh, I want to thank you all for sticking with us. And uh, we hope to have a really good program for you. Uh, special uh, thanks to our sponsor, Oracle, um, who is providing the who is providing the uh, the content, the tutorial. Um, our lab sponsor, Tosudo, uh, who is providing the uh, virtual labs for us this time. Uh, so very, very appreciated to both of you to, for, uh, for uh, helping us put this together. Um, so a few housekeeping uh, things before we start. Um, I'm on the Nanog PC. Um, so uh, if you have any questions about Nanog in general, uh, feel free to come to me. Um, uh, this slide's been up. Uh, if, you have, if you've had any trouble getting on the Wi-Fi, uh, come to me or somebody else at this table here, and we'll try to get you sorted there. Um, there is a 802NX uh, Nanog Aaron base station. You'll have to accept our certificate uh, to join that. Uh, there is also the legacy station, which is wide open with no authentication, but also no encryption. Um, so uh, you know, use that. Uh, you can use either one. Um, username, password, Nanog, Nanog uh, should be pretty simple. Um, we'll do our meals and breaks in this room. Um, the washrooms are in the, down the hall, the Georgia foyer near the escalators. Um, at 4 p.m., we will start the Nanog registration. Uh, that'll go to 6 p.m. Uh, that's in the Regency foyer. So if you want to break here and go get your badge, if you're, uh, if you're registered for the conference, uh, go ahead and do that. Um, our agenda for the day, um, we've uh, already got through registration and breakfast. So uh, check that off. Um, We'll be doing our opening and intro tutorial until about 10.30 a.m. Um, at 10.30 a.m. at the end of the uh, intro, uh, we will go ahead and break into teams. And what I'm going to do is, if you have an idea that you want to form a team around, or if you want to form a team around a brainstorming idea, uh, stand up. And uh, I'll go around and ask you what you're interested in doing. And then the other, um, other participants can uh, join, join the the project that interests them. Um, we will break at 12.30 for lunch. Um, you know, eat at your table, keep packing while you eat, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> and that will go from 12.30 to 1.30. Um, we'll do a refreshment break at 3, again, uh, here in the room. The food will be out there in the hallway. Um, at 6 p.m., we will close the, we will close the laptops for hacks. Um, at 6 p.m., we will ask each team to do a uh, quick presentation on, on their project and what they accomplished. Um, at the end of that, we will be voting for the winning teams. Um, the top, um, is it two or three teams? Uh, I think three. Uh, the top teams will be, then be invited to uh, present, present their work at the, uh, at, during the main session on Tuesday. Um, after the closing, uh, we will have a reception. Uh, the reception is going to be in here as well. Um, we'll bring in snacks and beer, wine, um, and uh, you know, stay out, socialize. Um, we'll go till 9. Um, Oracle, um, Dip from Oracle will be coming up in a minute uh, to uh, do a talk on segment routing and, uh, on, and the ways that can be automated. Uh, we'll have some samples uh, to get you all started if that's uh, and. Uh, you know, if we're going to work towards that theme. Um, if you have other ideas, feel free to bring them up too. Um, and on that, um, I will invite Dip Singh up to the table with Oracle. Hello, can everybody hear me? I think so. Good. All right, so uh, I am Dip Singh. Uh, I'm a network engineer at Oracle Cloud. And I'm accompanied by several of my colleagues over here. And I think we have one remote participant uh, whose colleague re joining remotely. So. So for an hour or so, what we're going to do is what we will be looking at the hack goals, which is going to be one of the hack goals. And then we'll spend some time into covering the background which we need to solve those hack, that hack goal. And uh, originally, I was planning to give you a quick dirty demo of how that hack actually you know, looks like if you don't have a mental picture. But because of the logistics, I'm going to skip that. But if you still are interested into that, I, you can come to me and I can show you it at my laptop. OK. so. With that started, this is you know the code of the day list. Um, that's the agenda. 
basically this is just a very verbose way of what I just told you that what we're gonna do for the an hour so and uh, so one thing which I wanted to do was before uh, you know I really go into the hack itself is that the motivation behind it right even though you will see segment routing is there and there are some other things but really the focus itself uh, you know is not really segment routing the main key theme here which if you want to take out from this whole exercise is that understand that how we can use uh, any programming language whether it's Python, Golang or whatever the language of your choice is, you can use that to gain deeper insight within uh, the, your networking domain, right? And time to time I hear, you know, over the internet like, you know, people say that all the network engineers are going to be software engineers and all those debates which, uh, you know, people will start and they will have these absolutes about uh, the stance on what they think. And my take there is that you should look at this is one of your tools in your engineering toolkit that will help you to be a better network engineer, right? So that's my take on this whole uh, thing. And obviously it's my personal opinion. It goes without saying that my current employer and my past employer does not hold this opinion. Uh, so uh, the problem statement, right? So the problem statement is that we all know that how we, you know, whenever we are building a network, the network itself need to meet certain performance criteria. And at the same time, what we want is that the network needs to, you know, like uh, uh, be fully utilized, right? So the capacity, whatever I have built in the network, it needs to be fully utilized. And the way we can solve that, like, if, would be using TE, which is one of our, uh, you know, one of the tools which we can use to make sure that you are meeting the performance criteria plus you are actually utilizing the network with the, from a capacity perspective what you have built, right? So, few goals around the traffic engineering itself are listed over here. These are very generic goals. These are not all the goals, but these are the three goals which you're going to focus for the rest of the day. Uh, the first one is minimum cost routing. Uh, minimum cost routing actually is where you're trying to find in a network a path between point A and point B with the minimum cost from go from point A to point B. Now cost itself is a very generic term over here, right? Uh, cost could mean anything. So in a network, if you have let's say IGP, right? You can say, hey, give me the shortest you know, weight, uh, which is IGP cost from point A to point B. Cost could be something like you can say that give me the minimum average delay between point A to point B. So cost itself is a very generic term uh, you know, here and it could mean different things depending on the context you are using as an example. The next is the flow aware min cost routing. Flow aware min cost routing is actually built up on the min cost routing where I'm adding an, another extra constraint that whenever you are computing a path, as an example, you need to be aware about the capacity available on that path, right? So you need to be aware about what flows are going through it, right? Uh, if you compute a path between point A and point B, if the capacity is not available, that's not the minimum path I'm looking for, minimum cost or path I'm looking for, right? So that's what I mean here by flow aware min cost routing. And the last part is the disjoint path routing. That should be pretty simple, right? What I'm trying to do is from point A to point B, give me n number of paths, and these all paths needs to be disjoint with each other, right? So these are the, some of the TE goals which we're gonna focus for the next hour, so. And what our goals are. So let me look, look at this picture view. Uh, so what you have is you will be given a network uh, topology, right? And the next thing what you want to do is extract that network topology details. It could mean a lot of the attributes associated with the topology itself. And then you build a model of, of, of that topology, how the network itself is. Then we will throw, look at some of the problems which we're gonna throw as a constraint. Say, so, okay, these are the constraints which you need to meet when you're calculating a path. Once that's done, you have to give, uh, you have to go and back and program the network. Now, programming the network itself, you you know, the way we're going to look at here is using XR BGP controller. It's a way for it's going to do the majority of the task, basically. Uh, uh, it will go ahead and say, okay, these are the computed paths are here. Let me go back and, you know, tell through the network that these are the final paths which you have calculated. And over what we have to do is we have to figure out a way, a programmatic way, to talk to the XR BGP of whatever the results we have computed. 
So that's a 50,000 foot view. We're gonna spend some uh, time in looking at the, uh, the deeper part of it. So uh, what you're gonna have is this a topology, which is basically a five node topology, all those uh, uh, nodes are Juniper VMXs. And uh, if you see, the, these are the link details, these are the IP addresses, blah, blah, blah. So that's, that's how a topology looks like. It will have an IGP, in this case, you are using ISIS as an example. You don't have to really know anything about ISIS. So these are just building blocks for the hack itself. And on the right, what you see is the cost and the capacity of each of those links, right? So for example, if, we, uh, if I see 10, 100 uh, for the link between VMX3 and VMX1, what it means is VMX3 to VMX1, the cost is 10 units, and 100 is the capacity available. The capacity units for, uh, is MBPS here. Uh, the reason I have to use max, uh, I was originally thinking of inflating those things to gigs or something like that, but the thing is that these are all gig interfaces, so I have to uh, scale it down to max. But those units really doesn't matter. What exam, what matters is what's the, you know, what's the capacity and what's the traffic demand we're gonna throw at it. So that's, that's the logical structure which you will see of the topology, right? So that's what you will be given. The next thing what you have to do is you will need to extract all that info and create a model around it, right? So the, your model needs to represent all the information which uh, you need to compute a path. So you will have to extract how things are connected with each other, what is the cost could look like, what is the IP address if I need to record that, these are the certain attributes which you may need. Uh, to record that. So the, all that should be represented in a model so that when you're really done with your computation and if you need to extract some information, you can uh, you know, use that to program it back. So that's the uh, problem step number one, right? So problem itself is divided into three parts. That's the, uh, that was the first part. The second part is that I have given four set of problems on the left and you basically have to uh, solve these uh, constraints which have been given. So the first one is very easy. The first one just says, go from VMX3 to VMX4 and figure out the shortest path, right? So if, I, uh, if, I, if you look into it, what you have is that VMX3 to VMX1 to VMX4 is the shortest path because the cost itself is 20, right, in the topology. So you have to compute that somehow programmatically. The next one is actually says that, okay, compute the shortest path, but I am looking for 200 max of capacity available, right? Obviously now that shortest path is no more a valid shortest path because you do not have the capacity available between VMX3 and VMX1. So what you have to do is, uh, you have to look into the capacity of those edges and you will see that the path which is the valid in this topology would be from VMX3 to VMX2, VMX1 to VMX4. That's your shortest path. Oh, the cost itself is 30 and the, there is capacity available on all the links. Uh, the third task is actually built up on the second one where I'm saying, okay, VMX5 is also looking to, for a path to VMX4 and it has 60 max of uh, the traffic it's looking for. So can I have that in the network? If I don't have the traffic demand uh, and without any traffic demand, VMX5 shortest path would have been to VMX4 directly. But that won't be the case because the capacity itself on the edge is only 50. So now if you look the other way, it would have been, it would have gone from VMX5 to two, to one, to four. But since the VMX3 is asking for 200 meg as well, it would have, if we use that capacity, the only path available from five perspective would be good from five, two, three, one, four. So that is the path which would be available for. So that's something which you have to figure that out. Now, the problem number three itself falls into something called multi-commodity network flow problems. So these are hard problems, depending on what's your background. It could be relatively hard. So you can choose not to solve this one. You can just focus on the other problems, right? And if you feel like enthusiastic enough at the end of the day, you think I have enough time left, you can come back and try to solve this one. And the fourth one is from basically from VMX3 to VMX4 in this case, you have to figure out two disjoint paths. Disjoint means basically whatever the path you have calculated, it should not overlap with the existing path. 
So in this example, it would be from VMX3 to VMX1 to VMX4, and uh, then you will have uh, the other path, distant path would be VMX3, VMX2, VMX5, and VMX4. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention that if you have any questions, feel free to bug me right there. Uh, it's easier for me to uh, answer at that moment. So, any questions so far? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, number three is right? What's that? Uh, number three is a hard problem to solve. It's, it's a little bit hard problem to solve. You have to you have to keep track. Whatever somebody has asked for it, what's the capacity available on that link? And you need to extract those, you know, so you keep track. So it's a little bit harder to solve. Now, there can be two spectrums of the people. Some people can look at it like this is, all this is very easy. And if you find all this very easy, come and talk to me, I can give you some harder problems to solve. And if you feel like on the other spectrum that this is too hard, just focus on the first problem and f skip two, three, four. Just do the first one, right? And just go from there. And then you can come back, because once you have solved the first one, you will have an idea, and you can come back and solve the two, three, four. No, it should be for whatever, so you have to look at two things, right? So if the, for the third problem, right? You know that there are two people asking for this much of traffic. I have to, if I, what you have to do is you have to solve for these two at holistically, but you need to figure out the shortest path for those individual paths. Make sense? So give an example. Let's just say that you started with saying that VMX5 I give 60 meg to the path which is available on 5, 2, 1, 4. Let's say you just do that, right? What's going to happen is then the, you don't have any capacity available the, for the first one, the VMX3 to VMX4 with 200 meg available. There's no capacity available. So there is something like, uh, or bin packing is an order of argument, how exactly you're looking at it. So you have to look at holistically. So. Yep. So each by itself could be minimized. Yes. But still, still there could be different solutions to this problem. Mm -hmm. Just an example. In one solution, it could uh, be one, a uh, minimum have one for the first path and three for the other path. Yep. And the other solution could be two for the first one and two for the second one. Yep. So which one is better? Doesn't matter. Uh, so you, what you need to figure out is basically, the answer is simple there would be, figure out the, Assuming the capacity is available for, let's say, path one, f find the best path in that case, okay? The second one, assuming the capacity is available, find the best path. Most likely, if the answers is the same, fine, but most likely, in this case, the answers won't be the same, what I'm trying to say. So answer won't be, it would be very clear cut, just by design I put that in, so that you don't have any confusions here. But always look at from one, between node A and node B, give me the best path which I can get, and the same way, uh, you know, give me the best path for the other, uh, others uh, from five to four, and they should be the best path in their own regards, assuming the constraints are met. Does that answer? Okay. Any more questions? I think we're good. Again, as feel free to bug me. Now once assume, so once you have uh, computed the path, the next, the last step is, you have to somehow communicate this to your BG, XR BGP controller, which you can pull it down, it's very easy to fire it up, uh, those paths, and the XR BGP is going to go ahead and program the headings. In this example, what I have is three and five as the two headings where you're gonna program the path, but uh, most, of, if you are solving one and two or four, you just need to program the VMX3 as a heading because that's where you're gonna program the path. If you're solving uh, problem number three, then only you actually will be talking with five as well at the same time. So if you just focus on the first few problems, just focus on programming it to the, uh, to the VMX3. So this is high level overview of the three problem components. 
clear as mud? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, again, as I said, feel free to just bug me at any time. Uh, now, in order to cover the first part, which is basically creating the model of the network, right? You need to have some background in the graph theory. How many people, as a show of hands, would know already about graphs? Okay, we have some some representation. Okay, uh, so graph theory is very important. It comes from is base. Was there a question? Uh, Graph theory is very important. Uh, actually, it comes is a branch of mathematics and it's used in a lot of different fields. And the, by the nature, the way the graph theory is, it fits very well with the communication networks. You can model that very easily. It's just like a natural fit. Some background about how graph theory really started. It started back in 1736 when Hewler, one of the mathematicians, visited the Königsberg and what you, the problem it was given to him was that you got these, uh, uh, this river and you have seven bridges. And uh, what uh, people asked was, is it possible to start from one place and can I cross all those bridges without crossing, using the same bridge again and, and cover all the seven bridges, right? So that was the problem, uh, origination of your graph theory coming back all the way from 1736. And the way you can look at it is basically something like this, where I have uh, this A, B, C, D, and all it represents is those land masses, and the blue is obviously the river, and what you have is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven are the, the bridges, right? And uh, you could envision these land masses as nodes, and if you don't understand what a node is, we will cover that in a moment. And what these uh, bridges, are actually the edges which connect these nodes, right? So what you see is A, B, C, D are nodes where I want to go, and they are interrelated with these bridges, which are, uh, which are basically some lines which you draw, and you ended up in something like this. So this is the graph, right? And uh, that was the uh, original problem. Uh, any idea whether the problem itself was possible or not? Anybody can guess? What was the answer for this? That can you do that? No, right? The answer itself is no. Uh, and the very intuitive uh, uh, you know, thinking about this problem is that if you think uh, each of the nodes which are connected, they're connected by odd number of edges, right? So A has three, C has five, D has three edges, and B has three edges. Now, obviously, if you are coming to a landmass with a, with a crossing a bridge in, and you're taking a different bridge and going out, it's in and out, you need to have pairs, right? So all of them have odd. So at some point, you will end up in a situation where you come to the landmass, but you don't have a way to go out, right? So that's probably the most intuitive explanation of this. There's a, you can go to the Wikipedia and understand about this problem itself uh, if you are more interested into this. Now, some formal definition for what a graphs are. Graphs are basically, you know, way to represent relationship among different objects, right? So, uh, what I have shown over here is on the right is the same topology which we saw that which we're going to use. You have these five nodes, and they are connected by some set of edges, and the edges have given some name. I've given them some names, right? What edges they are connected? What nodes they are connected to? Formally speaking, you can say that the graph is a basically uh, set of node and edges where the number of nodes and edges are finite. And each have uh, some property called degree. The degree basically means that how many edges are coming to a node. So for instance, number one node in this case has a degree of three. Uh, number three node has actually a degree of two, right? So that's what a graph looks like. It's, it's going to be a 10-minute graph theory, obviously. You know, we're not going to go deep. We're just going to scratch the surface of the subject. So uh, what are graphs? They actually uh, can have uh, two types, basic types of graph. One is called directed graph and an undirected graph. Directed graph will have, as you can see, there are pointers. So they, are, they have a direction associated with it. And the undirected graph has no direction associated with it, right? Uh, so what, and we will see how exactly it's relevant to us, uh, but directed graphs are also called digraphs for short. 
a lot of libraries, if you look into graph, they will actually use a short term called digraph. So if you see that, you know what exactly that means. Uh, each of the edges can have weights associated or prop, uh, associated with it. And that's, for instance, in the case if I'm modeling a network, I can say the IGP cost is a weight associated with one of those edges, right? So this is the representation of what a uh, IGP cost will look like between a random graph, right? So if you cover types of graph. Now, if you have a uh, undirected graph, you can convert that into a directed graph. And the way you can do that is by basically duplicate the edges. So let's say between one and three, I have this uh, single uh, edge with no direction. You just create two edges with two direction and you, uh, you have converted a directed graph into an undirected graph. Uh, in the case of directed graph, uh, what we have is a different term than degree, basically called in and out degree. In degree represents how many edges are coming to a node, and out degree means how many edges are going out of that node, right? So in this example, number three node will have two in degrees and two out degrees, which is symmetric here. There are some more graph definitions, and this will be the last one of the graph definitions, but I think it's important. Uh, so in a graph, we call a walk uh, is a term where we start from a node and we allow the, no, the edges and the nodes to be repeated in a walk. So as an example, you start in this example, if you look, you start from V1, you go to V4, V2, V5, V4 again, so it's a repeat of a node, and then you go take V1, which is a repeat of an edge, and you go to V3. So that's a walk. A trail itself is where you're not repeating the edges, so in this case, V4 is uh, uh, repeated, but the edge between V1 and V4 is not. So that's a trail. A path in a walk is where you're not repeating edges and the nodes both, right? So look from V1, you're going to V5, and there is no repetition of node or an edge. So in general, when we talk about in the network itself, hey, give me a path, a shortest path, that's what the path definition needs to meet a criteria that there won't be any edges repeated and there won't be any nodes repeated. And the last one is a circuit where basically you start from V4, V2, V5. It's kind of a loop. So that's what the circuit means in a walk. In our case, most of the time, network engineers are just uh, focused mostly on a path of, uh, in a graph. How do you represent a graph? You represent a graph by n by n matrix, and where n actually is the number of nodes. Uh, you could represent it by an incidence matrix, which is an n by m matrix, and where m is actually the edges of uh, so m is the edges of those of that graph. And the third one is adjacency list, which basically, if you're uh, if you're aware, aware about linked list, basically that's what the representation is, where you, uh, where you have a node and it has actually the list of what nodes are adjacent to me. So that's what an adjacency list would be. Over here, this example actually represents the first one, an adjacency matrix with an n by n matrix. So you have five uh, nodes in the graph. Uh, if you look, the rows and columns actually are the number of nodes. And if there is an edge which exists between source and destination node, what we are doing is we are setting one, right? So let's look at from one, if you look at the first row, one has two, three, four as set as one, because as you can see, the graph on the left is connected with two, three, four. So that's how a matrix looks like. An interesting property itself is that if you count the number of rows, it gives you the degree of that graph. So we know that by looking at it, it's easy that one has a degree of three, which you can always compute by the number of rows. The other interesting thing, if you're using matrix representation of an n by n, something like a square matrix here, uh, you can just do a multiplication of that graph, and you can come up with the, whatever the, uh, how many times you're multiplying that matrix, you can come up with how many distinct walks exist in the graph. So in this example, I have multiplied A by A, so you have A square, and the matrix which you got actually represents you the two length distinct walks in that graph. An example would be, let's say from one to one, you see three, right? So if you go, remember walk is something where you can repeat the edges and nodes, right? So you can go from one to three, and from three to one. So it's a two length, this walk. And how many uh, ways you can do that? You can do that for two. Uh, from one's perspective, you can do it for four, from one's perspective. So you got three two length distinct walks. Uh, 
other one would be let's say from one to five you have two right so if you look from one to five how many times how many what's the length of the walk itself would be uh, one two five and one four five so it's a two length uh, so you can only there are only two ways you can get that so that's that's just an interesting property okay so how do you create graphs? Uh, most of the languages itself have a lot of you know, graph libraries available. If you use Python, probably go with NetworkX, my favorite library. It's very rich. Uh, and if you are using Golang, you look at GoGraph, or you can create your own graph library as well. So you can start with structs and start representing nodes and uh, uh, different structure for the edges itself. Uh, this is just a sample code just to show you if you want to create a graph on the right of uh, the representation, let's say R1, R2, R3, you have three, three nodes in the graph and you have three edges associated with it. And that's the code basically shows you how do you create a graph. Uh, the graph is uh, undirected graph. That means that R2 to R1, uh, there is no, the edge itself has no direction associated with it. If you want to create an undirect, uh, uh, directed graph, you have to use uh, uh, the different uh, form of uh, uh, graph itself. Any questions so far? All good, am I going too fast, too slow? All good, good, okay. So what we have seen so far is how can I create graphs? We can use graphs to model a network by creating a bunch of nodes and vertices and edges. We could have certain attributes associated with those things uh, to store all the network properties which we want to. The question comes up is then that, okay, how do I know a network? How, where do I go and look for how a network itself is connected? Where is that information sets, right? That's the one thing which you want to know so that you can extract all that info and you create the connectivity model which you want to build. And the way you can do that is basically in, this is a simple example of uh, uh, you know, uh, how the current topology is. And you can look into something called TED database. TED is a traffic engineering database. And you look into it, how the net connectivity is. And it's a sample stripped down version of the TED, which I have put in here from the topology itself, where you have all the information. So if I want to read this TED database, it tells me that I have five nodes available. So I know that there are five nodes available. And they can be your five. Uh, nodes in the graph. Uh, from the perspective of one, which is MX1 over here, it says that my loopback over here is, uh, is 10001, I know that. How is MX1 or the router one is connected to other nodes? It's connected to three, four, and two. So if I go back to the topology here, look, which is representation of what overlap topology is. One is connected to three, two, and four. So I know that if I, from one's perspective, it's connected to three, four, and two over here. And what is my local IP? What is my remote IP? I also know that. What is the cost associated with that by the IGP metric? You can say that what this is the cost associated with that. And what is the amount of link capacity available is also there. So you have all the info to map, take that info, and you can create the model itself. And what you can do is, you, once you have created the model, the edges which you are creating, you can associate, oh, this edge has this capacity, this is my local IP here, this could be the remote IP, and you can store all those attributes in a graph. Questions here? Yeah. It's uh, unidirection. So this is from MX1 uh, perspective. If you, if you really go into the router, once we go into the later in the lab, you can see that it, from three's perspective, it will have a different graph. So it can be uh, non-symmetric. So, so that's where you have to really look into a, a directed graph where you have two different edges, one representing the one side of the house and the other representing the others, other way. And uh, the last part is uh, the some segment routing detail, which is there. Uh, I know that, uh, how many people know already know segment routing some form? I, so there is a decent crowd, right? So if you do not know about that, you really do not have to know segment routing too much. You have to just know one thing, and which we will cover in a two minute introduction of segment routing. Uh, not much needed there. It's just there to facilitate the hackathon, that's it. Uh, but if the, and I will cover these numbers uh, later, but all you need to know is that, uh, the data exist. 
So once you, you, when, you, when you're looking for some details, you can actually extract the data from the TED. That's, that's why it's highlighted here. And we will cover later what exactly this means. So this covers up so far the first problem part, that how you want to build a representation of a network model, right? Now we're gonna go to the second part of the problem. We are trying to compute paths based on once I have the model. So we're gonna move to the next part. And that's where the flow theory comes into picture because we start talking about flows. As you can see in the problem number second and third where it looks at how much flow is available, just don't give me the shortest path in that case. And uh, flow theory uh, is actually, you start with basically what you have in there is that you have a directed graph. Now at this moment you know what a graph is and you also know what a directed graph is. And direction, if you can see, these are the, the, all the edges have some sort of direction associated with it. And what you're looking for there is two terms, source and a sink. Source is where all the traffic is entering into the network and sink is where it's the traffic is going to the, right, what's the destination. And all the edges here points to how you go from a source to a sink, right? And each edge has some sort of capacity associated with it. So whatever the amount of traffic you are throwing into the network, it should not exceed the capacity, which should be very intuitive to us because we know that if the link is gig, we should not throw 1.2 gig or anything, it needs to remain, uh, the, cap it, the flow itself, whatever the traffic demand we're throwing, it needs to remain within the capacity of the link, right? So that's how you look at it. The other way you can uh, think about this is think about, uh, let's say you're pouring water from the source side here, and this will show you if you are the where, how the water will split. So from source, it can go two ways. So the water can split, some, some can go there, some can go down. And then once it goes to the top one, it can, the water can split again to the right or to the bottom. And the same way at the U, the both of which the water is coming in, it actually goes to a single pipe and it goes combined there. So that's how you can probably look into uh, of one way to imagine uh, the flows itself would be, right? So that's, that's how a flow, network flow, uh, you know, the model looks like here. Uh, and the one key property itself, uh, it follows is called something called law of flow conservation. So what, and again, it's very intuitive, right? So if I have 10 and six coming in at U as a node, the amount it's gonna go out is 16, right? What the law of flow conservation, which comes from Kirchhoff's current law, is basically saying that, you know, if you're not the source node and you're not the sink node, the transit nodes itself, you basically, whatever the amount is coming in, is the same amount which goes in. Simple. That means in a network, if you translate that, there is no traffic drop, right? Otherwise, so it's gonna be the same amount, right? So that, and this law actually allows you to form some mathematical basis uh, for let's say linear programming. In network flow theory, if you really go and start uh, you know, looking at the, uh, the, the, the literature around it, it's very closely associated with uh, uh, linear programming and then uh, many times you have com come up with certain algorithms uh, where you, you know, to compute it, but there are still certain problems which you, if the algorithm is not there, you actually use linear programming to solve those problems. And this forms, this law actually forms the one of the basis for it. To explain you what I was trying to say, so here is an example of five nodes again, and I have one, two, three, four, five, and what you have is the cost of those links and the capacity of those links, right? And uh, what I'm showing on this uh, left is the demand or the amount of traffic uh, flow which I'm asking this network from source is 10 units, right? So I'm saying, okay, I want to find a path which has actually 10 units of capacity available. At least minimum needs to have 10 capacity, but I want to transport 10 units of data. And uh, what you, on the right hand side, I have converted this left hand graph into a directed graph of how a network flow uh, graph will look like. And I have given each edges uh, some variable which is called the flow variables. And uh, the way you look at it, and this is a, very dirty intro of how a linear programming model will look like. Uh, 
Um, what you're saying here is, I want to minimize mathematically, saying that I want to minimize the, all the sum of the flow variables here, and that's my problem statement, with a certain constraint, the constraints are given down, which says, we know that x12 on the top plus x13 is equal to 10, because that's the amount of traffic coming in. Obviously, if it's splitting out, it needs to be equal to the sum of x12 plus x13. Right, simple, right? It's, it's high school maths here, right? So uh, the other is says that, the other one says that x12 minus x24 minus x23 is equal to zero. So what it means is if you look here on the top two, the, the second node, is saying if the capacity whatever is coming in is an x12, it needs to be equal to x24 plus x23. Obviously I have moved them into the left hand side, so that's why that equation looks like. So, but essentially saying that x12 is equal to x124 plus x23. In the same way, the third one says x24 is equal to x45, which is the fourth node uh, thing. And then the last one is basically saying x13 plus x23 is equal, needs to be equal to x35. So that's basically you have formulated the problem in a mathematical terms. And then you have added a constraint that the x as a value needs to fall between zero and 10. They cannot be negative, right? And they cannot mo go more than 10 because 10 is the ca capacity which has it of this graph, right? So that's how you can look at this. And if you solve this mathematically, what you're gonna get is an answer is, for this problem, is x13 is equal to x35 is equal to 10. Which you can, comp you know that if the 10 is the amount of capacity which I have asked, my shortest path from S to T is gonna be via 135. And that's what it basically is showing up. It's a very simple way to demonstrate this, but uh, if you go into the huge, you know, the bigger uh, problems, the variables, and the problem becomes quite large. But this is a very simple uh, demonstration of how uh, linear programming looks like here. Question, yeah. Exactly. Yep, that's it. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. So the, the solution itself, if I say 10, 10 needs to take a path, right? It should not be split between five and five. But uh, the way to look at it is like one way, if you are solving some sort of load balancing problems, that's where you could look into that part. But yeah, that's a, that's a good point, thank you. So now we're gonna look at uh, some graph travel algorithms because obviously you're not gonna use this to solve your shortest path problem. You're gonna use some sort of algorithm to solve that. And the well-known algorithm is Digestra. Uh, this is a quote from Digestra itself. This is probably my, the favorite quote, one of the favorite quotes in, uh, and uh, sadly enough, some, I find it very true many times too. So, uh, the Digestra algorithm itself is basically a breadth-first search algorithm. You don't have to know how Digestra works. You just have to know Dagestra is used for shortest path. And you can find some libraries which actually already provide Dagestra implementation to compute the shortest path. Uh, few things, highlights about Dagestra itself is that uh, Dagestra only work on weighted graphs. So what example would be the weight, for instance, IGP cost is a weight for the graph. So that's where it, you know, it only works for the uh, weighted graphs. And if you, uh, if all the cost of the, your path is equal, it's essentially to, you know, to, uh, become more like a breadth for search algorithm. It's, it has a greedy nature. It falls into greedy nature of uh, algorithms. Uh, and because of that nature, it, uh, you know, uh, it does not allow you to work with a graph which has negative edges. And what I mean by that is basically, if a graph, which you usually don't see in the network itself because you, know, you never have IGP cost which is negative, you start with zero or one and go on, but uh, in purely from a graph perspective that uh, if you have a negative edge, the, since it's greedy nature is always looking for the best from my perspective, it will never go ahead and explore that uh, negative edge because that can be hidden behind a, a bad path and then you suddenly have a big negative edge which, which may end up in having the whole path itself to be a lot more shorter but it just never explored those nodes. So because of this it doesn't work. There are other algorithms which work with the negative edges like Bellman Fold but it has a higher computational complexity. You don't see that in the network implementation around there but so that's one and then there are a few other uh, heuristic based algorithms as well but you, you don't have to look at that. 
Now, building upon the question which was asked, right, obviously that, okay, uh, do we have to split the flows? No, in reality, in the network, what you're looking is the non-splittable flows. And that's why I added a small uh, snippet of a network flow problem where you actually are asking for, hey, I don't want to split the flows. So if I am asking for in the same, you know, similar graph, I'm asking of 15 as a traffic, uh, the capacity which I'm looking for, uh, going to the sink, which is the fifth, five, fifth node, and uh, find me you know, a path, right? And whichever path you do, that's where the whole demand will go, uh, right? And it's a simple way I've done is X, Y, Z. These are the flow variables. The cost of all the edges are one, just to keep it simple. And what you will see here is the way you form this problem is you can say you minimize me two times x because the x has actually the cost itself is two times because all are unit cost plus 3y plus 4z. That's your minimize, that's your goal. Uh, with the constraint that x plus y plus z is equal to one. So that's the constraint which makes it that whichever answer you pick, the whole flow can needs to go there. Because if you look, x, y, z can be zero or one but they, so it, it will only be true if only one of them is one. Uh, and then there are other constraints uh, of uh, how the cost looks like, you know, I'm asking for 15 time, 15 uh, as the unit. So 15 Z needs to be less than 20. 20 is the minimum capacity which you will see for the Z path. And you solve that problem and what you will see is the answer itself is three as the unit of cost and the Y is one. So it will take the path in this answer. The best answer in this case is one, two, three, five is your best path. So that's, that's how you solve a problem with non-splittable flows. If this would have been a splittable flow, then you could have picked for the first 10, because this 15 is asked, because since the capacity is available from one to three is only 10, you would have chosen the answer go to one, three, five, and for the rest of the five, the answer would have come like use one, two, three, four, one, two, three, five. That would have been the answer for a non, for a splittable flow problem. That's a visualization which I really wanted to throw uh, for how this you will visualize, um, um, you know, mathematical problems. I'm a big fan of generally pictures uh, because it is make intuitive sense. If it may, what it really shows you is you, know, you have three planes, X, Y, Z of this problem and the Y itself is way in the corner. Since it's a 3D graph, it's hard for me to show you is where the best answer for this problem really is. There are other better graphs for non-splittable flows, but I didn't want it to confuse you further, so I just kept myself, okay, let's just show this one. Um, now, after the, how do you solve this if you have to solve it algorithmically, right? So one way is you can look at Digestro again, right? And say that, okay, uh, if let's say, if this is the graph I have given, and I have asked you, give me a path with uh, 20 units of flow, right? So what you can do is you can figure out all the edges which actually does not meet that capacity constraints, take them out of the graph. You're left with a graph which looks a little bit on the right and you can say, oh, now just compute the shortest path from source to destination. And that's, you will get an answer there. So that's one way to handle the capacity constraint with Digestra if you wanna do that. Any questions? <coughs> Good. All right. The third problem we now are gonna look into the disjoint path problems. Disjoint path problems is gonna be a lot more simpler than the, what you have seen so far, uh, if you feel that was too much. Uh, it's basically you have source and destination and you have to find n number of paths, let's just say two paths, pick up the first shortest path and then pick out, then figure out another path which is disjoint totally. There are two kind of disjointness, one is node disjoint and one, the other is edge disjoint. Edge disjoint means the edges needs to be separate. The nodes can be in that path. And node disjoint means, okay, edges and nodes, they both need to be separate, right? So node disjoint is usually a more restrictive problem than an edge disjoint path because you are not looking only for, in the node, you're looking for the whole node and the edge both needs to be in disjoint. So, and then you have maximally disjoint paths where you actually can afford to have some sort of overlap. Uh, an example is over here, let's say you have the same graph and I ask you, give me two disjoint paths from one to six and the first thing is what you can do is, you compute the shortest path, you figured out the answer here is one, two, four, six, 
So, okay, okay, I got that. Now you can take them out of the graph, remove them. You're left with the graph like something like on the right, and then say, give me another uh, disjoint path, and you will come up with an answer like this. And you computed two disjoint paths. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, one thing I want to make sure that, you know, like, uh, that uh, Diagostra will not be always able to find uh, with this method, right? So, for instance, if you look here in this topology itself, you have 1, 2, 3, 6, which is going to be your shortest path. And if you always prune those uh, edges, you're going to end up with a graph where there is no path from 1 to 6. You, there's no path, right? So, a uh, point here is that, you know, just because I am saying here for the sake of hackathon that you can use Digestra for finding disjoint path, in reality, it's not always the case. People look at better algorithms to you solve that problem. Um, so, there are different algorithms which you can look into it. If you're interested into a uh, hint would be like a Surabel algorithm, which actually works uh, uh, to find two disjoint path. And if you would run that algorithm in this topology, it would have find you one, four, three, six, and one, two, five, six as two disjoint paths. So, that's, uh, but that's a high level overview of how you can figure out disjoint paths. For our case, Dagestra should be enough. If you, but if you feel more, uh, uh, you know, like uh, ambitious, you can explore the uh, whose, uh, other algorithms which you can help you in finding better paths in most of the topologies. Okay, uh, with that said, it, we probably are going stepping back into a networking. Yep, yeah, question. Not much. Right now, for just for the is for the learning sake purpose pr perspective, Tagestra probably would for, you know not uh, fare well in a lot of the yeah. yeah. But for, for, for solving the other part of the problem, you need maybe a bunch of different iterations. Yeah, the it's fine. Just get the answer somehow. Yep. And we can look into if you have questions, we can look into some other algorithms which are readily available, which you can actually use it for that. Yep. Okay. Actually, I should have repeated the question. So basically, the answer question was that, you know, how much is the big O important for these tasks, right? And the, the answer here is that it's not important. Just focus on the hack, get the answer somehow, right? And the purpose here is not really, you know, the, is to start this whole thinking about how the, you know, really the intricacies and things works internally. So you have a better understanding about how, you know, about the network itself, right? So uh, it's, it's a way to, you know, it's like a combination of two things. You are using some sort of coding to learn how to code, and at the also same time, you're also getting better at your networking domain as well, because you have, now since you're thinking about the problem, you know at least that how, you know, people will solve this. So you're basically trying to be a better network engineer overall, because you're learning coding and you're learning your domain itself. So that's the go high level motive here. Um, now we're gonna really quick uh, cover into segment routing. I'm just gonna skip the slide. I'm gonna get right to it. And that's one thing. If you, if you have us in the case of segment routing, let me step back. How many know people know MPLS? A lot of people, so that's good, right? In MPLS, you know, usually, you know, if, uh, uh, what you have is, uh, uh, you know, there is a, in MPLS, you know, all, you know, the label itself didn't actually originally like the traditional MPLS when I say MPLS is a very bad term to say it over here, but uh, uh, in the RSVP domain or LDP domain, the labels which were given originally didn't have a global sig globally significant value, right? Uh, one way to look at it is think about a loopback in a network uh, or loopback of a router. It always is unique, right? Tens of, you know, whatever the loopback is, is always unique across the whole network, right? You're not having two uh, separate uh, loopbacks. In the traditional label allocation mechanisms, it was always that the labels were locally significant. They didn't have the concept of being globally significant. In the case of segment routing, what you have over here is that all those, there are similar to like loopbacks, you have a label associated, which is unique across the network, right? And we, uh, what we call them is, uh, the term you use is node set. And the way you achieve that is basically each uh, node 
have a block of uh, uh, the pool uh, associated for doing global allocation, right? So you have say that in this case, you have 100 to 200 is the pool you have been given from where you do your global allocation, right? And then, every, then you say that this is my, you know, you can say 101 is my uh, uh, global, uh, uh, global uh, MPLS uh, label and uh, that's going to be unique across it. So if anybody is trying to send it to you, they can use that label to send use that label to send it to that router. So for instance, if I want to send uh, to router six, I can say that okay, your global pool is this, and uh, I can figure out what your global MPLS label would be to represent you, and I can just put that label in and I'll send it to you. Uh, and it's similar to like if I have to send it to six and it, the IP address of the loopback of six was one six dot six dot six. I could use that to send it uh, in a normal IP forwarding mechanism. The problem came around was that uh, some vendors said, okay, we cannot have a sh you know same uh, reservation block associated for you know. So if so, some router is using, let's say, you know, some vendor says I'm going to use from 100 to 200, the other guy says no, I cannot allocate that pool for my global allocation, so I have to use a different pool. So then how do you solve that problem in the network, right? And that's where high level, that's, they came up with a, something called indexing as a format where you're actually looking at what your global pool is and what you're indexing that and you combine that and you figure out what is the global MPLS label which represents a, that node, right? So that's a very high level, loose definition which I've explained in a simple terms. An example of that is, let's say I want to send in this graph, one wants to send a packet to six with some MPLS label or global label. What I'm gonna do, what is gonna look at, 100 is your starting point, right? That's what we call as SRGB, SRGB is for segment routing global block, 100. And your index for that is six. So I'm gonna combine that. I know it's 106 and I'm gonna use that label to send it to six, right? Now, if you remember, these two details were available way back in your TED database, which I showed it to you, where it, uh, you can grab for every node, what is the global block is, and what is the index it is. And you can compute just by doing the two addition of your base plus the index to come up with the final MPLS label, which represents to that node. So that information is available in TED, which we looked at originally, but that's what it means here. So in this example, if I have to send this to six, and I want to send it via uh, uh, five over here, what I'm doing is uh, 106 and 15, yeah. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I have put two labels in the example. For five, I'm gonna use 105 as a label, and for to send six, I'm gonna use 106. And I've stacked these two labels together. 105 actually says, okay, let me send it to 105. When it gets to three, uh, PHP happens, and five only gets 106, and the 106, uh, and then it actually PHP happens again, and five to six, that's where, that's how you can forward it, right? The point here I'm trying to make here is that's how you compute a label associated with a node, which is basically use the, just the base label and the index and you combine these together. And that's it, that's all you need to know from a hack perspective here. There is one thing here which can throw you, uh, which I actually, when I was looking into the lab itself, the infrastructure which we had, there were some nodes, actually you're picking up a different block and that's why I did this, uh, this uh, slide, just to explain if your uh, lab infrastructure itself has this problem is that uh, let's say the five here says, no, look, I'm not gonna use 100, 200 as my global block. I'm gonna use 300 to 400, right? So obviously what you're gonna do is, if you are have to send something to five, you have to use 300 plus the index. That's gonna be your uh, global label representing five. So in this example, you see it's 305, 305, and PHP happens at three, so it sends it to five, and then you know five sends it natively to six. So these are this are like these are the two key points you just need to know about this. Any questions here? Clear? It's okay. Now uh, the last part is that okay, I have computed the path. I know how to you know. What we look started from was this. We have a graph, 
we computed the path. Now we need to communicate, and we also know what the labels for the, the whatever the ho hops you have chosen, you have computed the labels associated for that. Now how do I communicate this back to the network, right? And that's where you know BGP LU comes into picture, which is basically BGP label unicast. It, uh, the original RFC was 31007, and it was amended by uh, 8277, which actually resolves a lot of ambiguity around 3107, which was there. Traditionally, it's been used for inter AS option C or carrier supporting carrier use cases. But essentially, what you're trying to do is, if you're saying, let's say you have a destination, uh, 1.1.1, it can give you, and you also send, you can send the labels associated for that destination, right? So you basically is a way to communicate a prefix and the associated label bindings. Uh, if you're already familiar with LDP, RSVP, it's another way of label distribution essentially, right? Similar way. The only thing originally when the original implementation was, even though RFC never said that you cannot have multiple labels associated with that, most of the implementation turned out to be you can only use single label, and that's what got abandoned, you know, like uh, got fixed later on, where you can actually, people change that because of the SR as coming up, you can have multiple labels associated with it, so people, you know, fix their implementation. So now you can actually send multiple labels. Uh, this is how a config looks like in an XR BGP if you want to send that label stack. Uh, on the right, what I have here is uh, 10.0.0.4, which represents the destination of the router from. Uh, and let's say what we want to do is, we want to send the path from 3, 2, 1, 4. That's the path which we want to send, right? And the way you can do that is if you construct the route advertisement, from XRVGP saying that, okay, 10.00.4 is my destination. I have to use next hop. Next hop always needs to be whatever from three's perspective is where you want to punt that traffic out. In this case would be 10.0.17. You do not have to use a label to represent in your path for node two. It, uh, it, can, it, it you know, you just skip that part. But now what I'm saying in the label stack here is that, hey, my destination is four, and this is basically whatever the sRGB block was for four, and the index number uh, which I used computed the final label. And I'm saying uh, 800,004 is basically the label which I'm trying to use. And then the other top level on the left is basically what is the a path through which you want to punt. So I'm saying here to go via one and then go to four, right? So the real path itself is three, two, one, four. I don't have to use two because I am defining the next hop as this, so it's already covered there. But I do have to define that, okay, from two, where you need to go. It could have gone to five or it could have gone to one. So in order to force it to go via one, I'm using the label which represents one. Make sense? Too hard, too easy, uh, so, so. Uh, This is an example of uh, how uh, uh, the, you know, the, from a router three perspective. So before that, you know, the 10.0.0.4 was actually the loopback, which is associated with four, and that's the, you know, normal ISI as you're learning it. Once you advertise your path to three, uh, you will start seeing something like this in the below, what you actually you have is uh, 10004 is learned by BGP, and it basically shows up you the labels which you need to push. And you know if you do a trace route here, you can see here. Obviously, you don't have all the IP addresses recorded here, but you will see that it goes to 10017. Then 10012 is the uh, loopback of that, and 10012 is actually the loopback of the link between two and one, and then it goes to the four. So it basically becomes a three hop. Uh, Without, without uh, this uh, advertisement, it would have been just a two hop. It would have gone directly from 314. Now in this case, it's now going with 3214. So that's, that's, how, uh, that's how you can, you know, XRBGP can do it. Obviously, 
In this case, the next question comes up as, okay, how do I communicate with XRVGP programmatically, right? And there's a lab doc where we basically, which I have given few examples, which you can look into it. And if you really struggling with that, there's a small code snippet, which you can use actually to communicate between XRBGP and your whatever the path you have computed finally. But you do have to compute at least the path, what it would be the, what is the destination you are trying to send and what is the label stack looks like. Once you have formatted that path, you, you, know, you can use certain examples which are in, is in the lab doc to uh, communicate to XRBGP and XRBGP will go ahead and you know, uh, program the network. Obviously that means that you have to bring up your BGP session between XRBGP and the node itself first. And the, the, that also, all that information is available in the doc so you can just copy and paste most of it. And if you have any questions there, you can come, come and ask me. So that part should be very uh, clear there, uh, at least in the lab docs. Um, any questions? All good? Well, with that, I'm gonna end up uh, the presentation and uh, I will send it to, uh, I'll invite Chris. Yeah, sure. Do we all get the pod number? We do get the pod, no, right. Yeah, okay, yeah. Any more? I'm, I will be here, so you know, feel free to, if you feel like you're lost, I can give you some directions for sure, right? So, and if you feel like it's too easy, come and talk to me and I will give you a harder problem. So, with your spectrum you lies in, it's all good. Thanks, Dip, for the presentation. Um, we're all still here. Great. Um, so um, we have a number of labs. Um, we, we, we try to do this uh, one group to a table. Um, if your group is more than five, that's okay. We just don't want really large teams. Um, you know, just keep the size under control. Um, what I'm going to ask, what I'm going to ask people to do is that if you have an idea for something that you want to uh, to start work on and uh, get some, get some, put a team around, um, go ahead and stand up. Anybody? <laughs> okay. All right, um, so okay, um, so self-organize, I mean, if you have an idea, uh, talk to people, um, you, know, you know, maybe the people at your own table, um, mingle if you like. Um, okay. Yeah, th yeah, that's that's a very good point. I mean, talk to talk about talk to people about what your what your favorite languages are, what you think you can work most effectively in. Um, get some synergy among the teammates there, um, and um, you know that will help things along a lot. Um, if you're not a programmer, uh, you can you you can still contribute. I mean, ideas. Um, We'll be asking each team to uh, put together a short side deck with their work uh, to present, uh, so you can help there, um, or just you know you know find you know find ways to be to be useful, or just just hang out and watch <laughs> and watch if you can. I mean, we won't hold it against a size team if if, uh, if you would just like to observe. Um, we have a Slack channel. If you have not gotten an invitation to it, uh, please. Come up to us, and we'll make sure you get access to that. Uh, we'll be posting some links in the channel. Um, we have a Google Doc. Uh, if you want to uh, join that doc and uh, and post ideas, um, and of course we can all you can all talk in this room. Uh, we have one person uh, joining remotely. Uh, he's in the Slack channel, um, so um, feel free to communicate there. Um, he'll make himself known, I'm sure. Um, afterwards. Um, I said, uh, 
about two to three minute presentation on what you've done. Um, make sure that you save screenshots. Uh, these are all virtual labs. They're going to be shut down at the end of the day. They, um, you know, they, they Google cloud charges by the hour. <laughs> so, um, and then Tuesday at 3.30 p.m., uh, we'll be picking the, the best. Um, afterwards, we'll be opening up a voting tool. Um, and uh, we'll ask people, give people a few minutes to vote for who they thought the best team was. Uh, I ask that you avoid uh, voting for your own team. Um, and then uh, at the end, uh, we'll announce those. And then the winning teams will be able to present at 3.30. Uh, and we'll follow up with you afterwards to uh, prepare those slides. Um, that said, um, I think we're ready to go. Um, we're all at the front tables. Um, you know, all the Oracle folks are here. Um, Nanog PC folks are here as well. If you have any questions, concerns, feel free to come up to us. We are distributing f pods using this high-tech method called paper, <laughs> pen, pen and paper. Um, there is a Google Doc in the Slack channel with uh, instructions on how to access the labs. Um, and uh, once you once you have a team established, come up and we will uh, we will give you a. We'll give you a pod number, and you can get started with that. Um, you know, the lab topology is is in the doc that is uh, in the channel, so you can look up that. And again, come to us if you have any questions. You ready? All right. <laughs> Thank you. Let's get started. Okay. Okay. One. One more bit of housekeeping. Um, when you come up to get a pod, uh, I would like you to come up with a team name so we can track which teams uh, have, are using which pods, and we'll be using those later when we do the presentations. Thank you. A few minutes after six, um, time is up. Do we have, I believe we had another team that was going to give us their name. I said, all right. <laughs> the, the switch is hard to move. Um, so if we can get, um, if every team can uh, let, let me know who's, who's going to be coming up to do your presentation. Um, we uh, will start in a semi-random order, although based on who got their pods. Um, where is Team Buffs? All right. Uh, are you ready? Okay, come on up. Team Buffs. Now, just a quick note, we have HDMI and mini display port for, uh, for hooking up your laptop to the to the monitor. Um, if you don't have either of those, please let me know ASAP and we'll try to get you set up. Uh, do about two or three minutes if you can. Uh, we've got, what, eight, 
nine teams presenting and an hour to do it, so. Hello, everybody. We are Team Buffs. This is segment routing in one day. This is uh, how we approach the problem. The first thing is we collected the relevant information uh, using the TED database. We convert it into a graph. Um, we use an SPF algorithm based on cost. And we generated labels which were used for segment routing. This was then given to XRBGP using an API. And we used BJP, LU, NLRI to push it into the routers. We mainly used Python for all our coding. So we used the Juno SpyEasy library to make a remote procedure call on all the devices. So we connected to each device. And we got the TED database information in terms of a JSON format. And then we passed through the JSON format to get the relevant information, which was the source uh, switch and the destination uh, router, source router, destination router, reservable bandwidth, and the cost which we were looking for. Uh, a discrepancy we did notice when going through this was that even though LLDP information did not have two links connecting between MX3 to MX4 and MX3 to MX5, when we passed the information from the TED database, we noticed that there was that connection. So that is the information that we got from it. So we proceeded with the problem. Our focus was on solving the problem. So we went forward with this information that we gathered to run the shortest path uh, algorithm. Uh, so for the shortest path, we achieved all the three objectives. As you can see, this is the first objective where we have the shortest path. Once we computed the shortest path, we also have the command ready which the XRBGP needs to send information. Uh, this is the second thing, this is the disjoint path links. So what we did here is, as you can see in the previous diagram, we had one extra link. So we have three disjoint links between our MX1 router to MX5 router. And once we compute all the possible links, if you can see the last message there, we get a message, no more routes possible. Finally, what we did is we allocated 50 Mbps bandwidth for per link and we computed how many possible links are possible between two routers. As we can see between MX1 to MX5, we have about seven routers exhausting 50 Mbps bandwidth. Yeah, so for XRBGP, we actually spent a lot of time just trying to get the XRBGP session up between the VM, which was hosting the scripts, and the router MX3. So as you can see, from our CSPF algorithm, we were able to generate the string, which is actually the, the labeled unicast route, which gets pushed onto the routers. So that's there on the first screenshot. And uh, the next uh, screenshot explains the route which, which was pushed. So on the second last line, you can see the, uh, the debug output that route was added to the neighbor with so-and-so IP and so-and-so peers. So we were able to generate a route based on the CSPF algorithms, and we were also able to push that route on the routers. Uh, this, uh, so again, because of the discrepancies which we, my colleagues have mentioned before, we weren't able to see the trace route of the ping or, or trace route of the ICMB packet according to the path which we wanted. So we went to the each and every router to see each and every hop. And on each and every router, we were able to see the exit interface. So that's how we confirmed that our routes were being actually uh, pushed uh, through the topology. Uh, to conclude, I would say, yeah, we need one more week in Vancouver. We really like it here. <laughs> and uh, I can very proudly and happily say that we were able to achieve all three objectives with a very high degree of success. Obviously, there was few discrepancies, but we were able to tackle them, and we were able to achieve all three objectives. So yeah, con congratulations to all my teammates. And thank you so much for having a wonderful hackathon. Thank you, everyone.
Uh, can we get a missing semicolon? Where is Miss I semicolon? Come up to the front of the room. Hi, so we basically are going to do a uh, coding demonstration here very quickly instead of using slides. Uh, so as you have probably seen there, the format that will be returned uh, when we get the information from the router will be this format, but we can also get some more manageable or parsable uh, file, which can be uh, JSON. Uh, and then from here, we, uh, we were able to actually extract the right nodes, which we will need for the actual uh, creating the graph. So here, here are the nodes. We uh, generated two dimensional arrays of each one of them, which uh, link to the appropriate nodes. And then after that, we generated the graph with the right edges and the right costs and capacities, which from there we calculated the using like Dyson's algorithm, which. Yeah, so I, I took the graph algorithm part of this and and basically just, just fed this graph into network X in Python. Um, so there we were able to use the shortest path function, and then I, I wrote uh, a little algorithm for the multi-commodity uh, problem as well, which we'll, we'll display here, and, and we can talk about that whenever that goes on. Yes, yeah, so I can talk about the multi-commodity path uh, algorithm. So uh, we wanted to find the shortest path from, I think it was three to four and five to four simultaneously. And the issue was they wanted to use uh, a link at the same time. Um, and so to get around this, what we did was we, it's not very efficient, we calculated uh, all routes from four to three and all routes from five, or all, all routes between the two pairs of things, and then just sort of greedily took the cheapest one and combined them to see if they were compatible. Um, and they are, there exist two compatible paths, and so we, we stitched them together using that. All right, uh, so right now we're just gonna calculate the shortest path from MX3 to four, and what we're doing is whatever we do, we're gonna append it with the correct format, and we will automatically push it so it'll force the packet to take said route. All right. Uh, oh, I don't have it. Okay. If we uh, if we had the other slide, it would show how uh, it actually did push it, and we were going to have a the ping that that shows that the route was actually taken, but you know, we don't have the luxury of time. <laughs> uh, no. Yeah, and then uh, for the parity problem, is there one you wanna do? Yeah. Uh, right. Oh no, this one. Oh, oh no, so we just did the parity problem, yeah. So depending on what we do, uh, this will be returned. Uh, if we say we have two different endpoints and we have two different payloads, then that'll return both parities. And depending on which one we pick here, it'll push it and it'll assign the appropriate thing. But if we wanna solve the second problem, let's just comment this out. And And that should push the different route. So you see these sort of thing? Yeah. Sorry, we, we actually did everything except for putting it together into slides. <laughs> so yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. It was fun. We did it. The Lost Pod. Come on down.
can we at least get the problem statement slide up on? Maybe you can yeah. just, I'll just talk to it. Okay. All right, uh, we'll get started here. So uh, we're part of the, uh, the Lost Pod team and uh, our overall solution, uh, we split it into three parts. So we started with the data collection, uh, then we had a, another team member that was working on the graph solutions to the problems, and we had a third team member that was working on uh, the exit BGP so we could advertise uh, all the routes to our routers. Um, we use Python um, to collect the data uh, or to write all of our scripts. And for the data collection, we use the NCC client in Python and just did a, a XMR RPC call to get the TED database and convert that into the XML into a Python data structure and parse out the uh, data that we needed. And uh, then we use the network X module to uh, generate our graph file. Uh, we end up, uh, to solve all four problems, we used four different, or two different types of graphs. We had an undirected graph, and then we had a directed graph, because problem three was easier to solve with a directed graph than undirected. Um, so we uh, have up here just logged into one of our routers, but uh, for the first problem, uh, we just did a, a simple um, SPF algorithm in Network X to calculate the solution. That was pretty simple. Uh, for problem number two, which is where we had some bandwidth reservation, we just uh, generated a graph. We removed links from the graph that uh, didn't have enough bandwidth, and then we uh, calculated the shortest path on the remaining edges uh, for our solution. Um, for problem number three, uh, we actually implemented it in two ways. So one of our team members uh, took the solution and uh, he split the stream. So he found the... Uh, the path that had partial bandwidth and he provisioned that then removed those links or the the bandwidth from those links and then computed the, the another path for the remaining bandwidth so we got streams uh, splitting on those and uh, we also did uh, another simple solution where uh, the more straightforward one where we basically uh, computed the first path subtracted the the bandwidth from the links and then computed the uh, remaining path for the, the second 60 megabit. So we, we got that problem. And then for the fourth one, we uh, just implemented a simple solution where uh, we computed the first path, we removed those edges, and then computed the second one. Uh, so once we uh, computed the path results, we uh, loaded those uh, modules into our, our main program, and then we wrote them to a, a log file and had XBC, BGP push them out to the network. Uh, so, yeah, go ahead. Uh, cool, so I'll just quickly go through and kind of demo all the different things that we have. Um, I wish there's a way to hold this better. Uh, so this is just kind of showing that there's nothing on here right now. Uh, so it's trace route, no labels as you'd expect. Um, XBGP is running here, but there's nothing going through it. That's eh, fine, I got it. Um, so we're gonna run this with problem one. Uh, so problem one will go through, figure everything out, figures out the path, uh, and then if we go over to the router, we now see the new kind of labeled path, and you can see it routing across it. Um, if we run this for problem two, uh, you're going to see the same thing. So there's a new path and a new way across the network. Problem three I'm going to skip because I have to run those separate. Problem four I'll run, but we weren't able to get to figuring out either the add path or what was going on here um, because it's writing both paths to XABGP. If you look here. Um, uh, perfect. Well, that would explain why this flips back and forth between routes if we sit here and watch it. Cool. Um, and then, so problem three. Uh, so this is the first way, kind of solving it, uh, finding the two unique paths through the network. Um, so kind of the output there. The other version of three is, well, I'll show you this really long version of it. That's probably not very useful. Um, so this one shows how it splits up um, using like the 100 meg and the fi uh, 50 meg of the lower latency paths first, and then split it off and use the other paths for the additional uh, bandwidth. And this one was not written in XBGP because it was only peering with one router and ran out of time. So, anything else?
Thank you. Thank you, Lost Pod. <coughs> Next, let's have the newbies. Cat 5e Hurricane will be next up. Thanks. Quick reminder to everybody, um, make sure that you get screenshots of your solutions. Uh, the winning teams are gonna be, gonna need to make slides to present on Tuesday and the labs probably will not be running and main session is pretty dangerous for doing live demos anyway. So uh, please uh, don't forget those screenshots. All right, we are team, uh, team newbies and uh, we named our project Waterfall. Here are our team members. Um, we approach the problem in a little bit different way. Um, one of the things that I'm very interested in is how to take uh, very uh, high bandwidth, greedy flows uh, and try, the, try to route them uh, around the best path in the network. So typically, the, uh, in any network, ISIS, you tend to represent uh, latency in terms of cost. So the idea is, what if we can take individual flows that are coming through that router, feed them into a, an SPF engine, and generate for those flows uh, some alternate path uh, away from, the, from a perhaps congested, um, um, a congested uh, best path? Um, so we, the way we approach a problem, not, not dissimilar from what has been presented already. Uh, there's, there's something that figures out uh, what that best path is, uh, then there's a way to get that information into the XBGP, and then XBGP shares that with, the, um, uh, with all of the routers. Um, so our program flow, uh, gather the topology information, gather the flow information, uh, actually run uh, the shortest path al algorithm, constrain shortest path, uh, rebuild the XBGP configuration with the flow information and have the XBGP announce those routes. Um. Okay, so, well, sorry. Um, so uh, part of my job was I was the communicator, so we took in the information from the like the brain of the operation, the part that figured out what was the shortest route, and we translated that so that it could talk with the EXA BGP. Sorry, long acronym. Um, so in order to do that, we had our three steps. So we received the data, we translated it, and then we sent it off. So when we received the data from the computer, engine, we took it into a loop and we broke it up into a couple of variables. We had our destination IP, our next hop, and label one and two. And these were the steps, essentially, that then we would process in the EXA BGP. So then we had to translate it, so we took it through, we broke up it, it into variables, and then we saved them into a library and we then looped it through so that it would print out all the information so that we could then cycle it through the configuration file. Um, so we created it, we the configuration file, we implemented the code, we converted the documentation, and then we sent it off to the XMBGP readable format. Uh, yeah, so I worked on the XMBGP part. Um, Downloading and installing it in the dev environment was pretty simple. We just cloned it from Git. But uh, we had to create the in and out files and the environment variables, also pretty easy. It kind of just told you what to do with the error messages. Um, where we struggled for seven hours is to uh, format and load the configuration uh, the correct way, like a configuration that it can actually digest. Um, so I, I eventually got a configuration to actually work 
with some dummy data, um, real IPs, real stuff, but like nothing that actually came from the shortest path uh, computation. And so it, you can see there, it's actually loading the configuration successfully. Um, what I didn't get to was uh, figuring out how to push um, that configuration to the head end to allow it to you know, transmit the, or program the shortest path. Uh, on the topology side, uh, we uh, struggled quite a bit to, uh, uh, to get that information. Um, we didn't have a lot of Juniper expertise, so the, gathering the information via RPC was, uh, was a, a tough thing for us to, uh, uh, to consider. So we thought, yeah, let's just create a, a flat file. Uh, well, even creating the flat file had its challenges as well. Was, Where do you find those labels? It's just struggled with that for, for a good while. Um, the learning curve for, for Network X also um, was, uh, was a factor. Um, trying to figure out how to filter the edges uh, such that the optimal path was removed, um, that one was, uh, uh, was, was a difficult one for us to, to figure out. Um, so you can see my comments there. <laughs> the comments, unfortunately, don't translate to working code. Not yet. Um, some of the other challenges we faced, just, just connecting into the environment. We had uh, some, u some uh, Windows users here, so uh, some of them were using PuTTY, uh, so you had to figure out how to convert the keys. Um, so uh, that one took us a little while. Um, programming languages, uh, I've been doing Python for probably five or six years now, maybe a little longer. Um, the rest of the team didn't have um, hardly any Python experience. I, I don't think anybody walked in here knowing Python. So uh, the, the team learned a lot today in, in terms of just how to use the language. Um, yeah, I, I, that's, uh, those are the main challenges. That's all we have. Oh, you get your number. I would just like to say, um, that we deserve a huge shout out because all of us except for one of us was first time hackathon participants and we did so much, we learned so much, we had a ball and we are walking away with a lot more knowledge than we walked in with. So thank you so much. All right, next up, uh, let's get Cat5e Hurricane. Where are you? Hi. So without much ado, uh, we are Team 5 Cat5 Hurricane. And uh, just a brief overview, uh, we did not want to restrict ourselves to any specific routing engines or libraries which are uh, vendor specific. So we used NAPAM uh, to fetch all types of data, uh, which runs across a wide range of platforms and has more commands, uh, uh, more command set now, uh, before, like before it was uh, limited, kind of. Uh, we use Network X, BGP LU, and uh, the controller to provision tunnels, and we believe that it will obviously impact your MPLS cloud. So this was our topology. Uh, uh, so while we achieved all the objectives which we uh, wanted to, uh, and which were provided at the beginning. We also wanted to look at IGP, which is your underlying uh, protocol to run any kind of MPLS or any BGP or anything. So uh, what we wanted to do is programmatically aggregate flows per interface and also ensure that bidirectional traffic from A to B, while you choose your best parts, you push your labels, but you also have to think about how VMX4 will go to VMX1 or 3, whatever your head end and your source and destination are. So uh, we saw that when, uh, while we took RSVP into consideration and all the other uh, which factors which we had to take, we also took into consideration the uh, core raw input-output packets which we get at the interface level uh, so that when they take more traffic, you also take that into consideration and use a dynamic approach and don't prefer those particular parts if they are as a part of your SPF calculation. So how do we achieve it? Uh, we use this path computation algorithm. We, uh, we periodically poll it, and uh, this gets pushed into the route logger file, which has a set of commands uh, through a final advertisement, a test script, 
will poll for it every 15 to 20 seconds, which is configurable. And uh, this uh, then pushes to the XRBGP engine. <coughs> so, um, yeah, I think I, I, all of this has been covered before, but I'll quickly go through some of the hacks. So, uh, we start off with XRBGP. Uh, so, the first one was the SPF calculation, which was pushed as uh, 1314. Uh, we saw the routes. Um, we also got the labels on trace route. Uh, so, this was the path which was taken three VMX3 to VMX1 and then to VMX4. We have largely routed on uh, node SIDs. We would love to check uh, ad adjacency SIDs as well uh, while configuring SR. Uh, so now considering, let's say this is oversubscribed uh, or RSVP takes uh, kicks in and you have some bandwidth which is controlled. So not to worry. So we uh, ran ping tests continuously to check the health of the current topology. We chose a other route, uh, which is the second run, the second objective and which it takes this way. Again, if there's any issue with that, and uh, constant monitoring on all the interfaces, uh, we uh, go for the third run of the controller, we announce that particular label, stack of labels, now it goes through three, two, five, four. Uh, what did we learn? Uh, provisioning SR tunnels on the fly, uh, and uh, integrating a lot of these different components which every one of us used. So. Uh, to conclude, I think uh, it's, it's very important to also look at your IGP. While we do have complicated approaches of MPLS segment routing and uh, everything possible to ensure our flows go correctly, but we can use a similar approach to ensure that our path costs are dynamically calculated looking at the IGP as well as RSVP in your uh, to, uh, topology or infrastructure. And uh, this could be used in any MPLS uh, large scale core infrastructure and takes care of link failures and oversubscription. So, thank you. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Right. Uh, next team failed to route. Can team failed to route get up here? <laughs> Do we? They canceled? Okay. No. Failed to route, failed to route. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, next team is 5S. Come on up. Yes. <laughs> uh, so I bullied our team into not doing something on segment routing because I didn't want to deal with graph theory because. I left college for a reason. Uh, so we did all uh, automated OSPF troubleshooting. Um, also, uh, I work at Cumulus, and we have a Cisco employee, so the idea of touching dirty Juniper routers wasn't very fun. Um, so we used uh, a Cumulus lab to do all this, so we went way off script. So it was a combination of Cumulus, Ansible, and Python. So it was a Cumulus network. Um, Ansible would configure both the healthy and broken states. Uh, so we could pl push an Ansible playbook to totally provision the network. We could push another playbook to break it and validate what we're doing. Uh, and then we would use Python to pull and parse the JSON output to the box. So we built some network-wide checks across the team. Uh, so we check that MTUs match on all the links in the environment. We make sure that there are no duplicate router IDs in OSPF. We check interface states. Um, I didn't put it up here, but we also make sure that there's matching uh, OSPF network types on each side of the link. And it's not that hard or sophisticated. Um, so we, you know, this isn't really about walking through the code, but we connect to a device, we run a command, we loop through the output, parse the JSON. So it's really just the idea of saying, look, troubleshooting is a programmatic thing that we're doing anyway as network engineers. Why not actually turn it into a program? It's all on GitHub, uh, Plumbus, it's me, slash nanog74. Uh, so let's see it. So we'll connect into every device in the network, all four, six devices, checking links, checking LSPF network types, uh, and then finally checking that the MTUs match on both sides. 
And then after this passes, we'll break it and run it again. One thing that I'll note here is that our code is extremely inefficient, so it takes a little while. So like I said, we're just using an Ansible playbook to break the MTU, so it's going to go in and break MTU on a couple of boxes. Apply the change. And then we run our test again, and we can see that all of the link state stuff is just fine. Don't be a hater. Uh, but now we will sit and churn through and check the MTUs, and we should see that there are MTU mismatches in our environment. Oh no. Oh. Ah. Okay, I can fix this. So, uh, it was pointed out that we're changing the MTU on every router, so we're breaking the MTU equally everywhere, so it doesn't actually break anywhere. So we're going to unbreak and rebreak it. All right, try this one more time. Everybody gets a mulligan, right? If it doesn't work, I'm blaming you. No whammies. Yeah. So. That was what we did. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next team up, uh, OABC. Where are you? Okay, hi everyone. So uh, we're team OABC for Oracle Arista, and we have a person from BC here, so <laughs> we, uh, we have wanted to name that. And so our overall strategy is very similar, similar to how everyone is doing it uh, using the graph. So basically, um, first we're going to use the sh show TED database extensive uh, to basically get the network topology and extract the data. And then we basically list uh, the router name uh, with the destination, uh, the IPG metric, the reservable bandwidth. Um, and from there, uh, we eliminate the bandwidth lesser than the reservable bandwidth. Yeah, so, so, okay, so we started brainstorming about this. The first question was, how do we come up with the shortest path algorithm? where you have the shortest path and also the path has enough bandwidth. So we, we were going to run the iteration twice uh, or iterate over it twice and then the second idea that we had was, uh, you know, we actually change uh, the shortest path algorithm where uh, we find the shortest path and then if there's no bandwidth, we run one more iteration of it rather than, you know, changing anything. So then we came up with an idea of why not just take out all the links where the bandwidth is lesser than the specified b uh, bandwidth because the shortest, the, uh, the narrowest part of the pipe is what you don't want, right? And then you run the algorithm over the rest of the network and then you have the shortest path with enough bandwidth. So that was the idea. Uh, and then populate the shortest, ca uh, the, the matrix with the, you know, the, the cost of the links and then search for the shortest path. Uh, and then use ExaBGP to distribute it. Unfortunately, our uh, you know software development team is still working on it. Next quarter, we'll have the release out with this. So. <laughs> okay, we don't have uh, we don't have a working model, but we have snippets of the output, so we didn't include it. So that's where we are. Thank you. All right, last team up is RPKI Fixers. Come on down. Oh, okay. So, uh, these are some of our thoughts on the state of RPKI and BGP. Uh, 
we've seen that there's some problems in that anybody can pretend to be uh, any ASN when they're plugged into a lot of other people. And RPKI depends on RIR stability to actually go back and verify uh, the RPKI stuff as well as to issue more and things along those lines. There's not a secure fallback. Um, it also doesn't allow end-to-end -end source verification when you're trying to find all the routes all the way back to where stuff comes from. There's not a sort of a chain of trust all the way back to the beginning. Um, also, man in the middle is a specific problem uh, for a lot of things that's been talked about being addressed a lot more in standards nowadays. And uh, the solution that we came up with is uh, just using a whole bunch of blockchain to try and you know, attack the problem because it kind of seems like something it could attack. Um, and blockchain is probably the wrong word for it because there's been chain of trust with SSL certificates and things like that for a million years. So it's something more along those lines. Um, but we make it so there's a nice genesis block you know, from IANA actually say where everything is in the world and make it so the RIRs can assign and revoke but with all signatures along the way uh, in a ledger. Um, have a majority of the non-authoritative ones countersign the ones that are authoritative so that one can't accidentally mess something up. And then the IP holders are then authoritative to assign and countersign other ROs and, uh, and pairing agreements or just basically along the way. And so one of the first ones that anybody right now can pretend to be any ASN and so a peer authorization between BGP partners and they can countersign uh, their RAOs so that every time there's a handshake between the two, you know they're trusted, 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 trusted. And uh, the RAOs can also propagate revocation. So if you don't want them to announce your ASN, you know, five levels deep or whatever it is, you just turn that off. And uh, problem number two is it depends a lot on the stability of the RARs. With this is, it's a peer-to-peer -peer transport of the ledger of all the signed RAOs and PAs along with the global routing table. And so because all those things propagate already, you can add a little bit of information to it and it'll still propagate throughout the whole world. Um, so there's uh, five RARs plus IANA, majority of them be three required to sign, uh, to revoke and reassign, and then if more than like 1% of the ledger is changed like all at once, like somebody accidentally deletes the whole internet, then have a little bit of manual intervention or verification at least. Um, problem three is that there isn't right now a good end-to-end -end source verification. This chain of trust ledger all along the way allows that. And so that sort of solves that. And then problem four is the man in the middle. Uh, Matt, MacSec is uh, an Ethernet level point to point encryption. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to configure it. There's a lot of hardware that's coming out or is out that has it available. When it's integrated with this chain of trust, um, you could use it as a layered encryption that will allow uh, more protection against man in the middle attacks. And that's it. Thank you to all the teams. All right, um, so we are going to be posting a straw poll link. Um, give about five minutes for everyone to uh, put in a vote for their own team, for, for the best team. Please do not vote for your own team. It's an honor system, but we want you to vote for, some, for a different team uh, than your own. Um, so, so, Michael is posting the link in the channel and if you can send it to me, I'll. So the link is in. The link is in the Hackathon channel, so go forth and vote.
And while we're doing that, let's, um, we have a raffle, so we've got some prizes to give out while we uh, wait for the voting to finish. So, sure. All right. Let's try to start with the, let's try to start with the smallest things first. All right. Okay. Okay. Does everybody have your ticket out? All right. The first prize is a Lever Gear Tool Card Pro. It's a wallet sized multi tool. Um, the ticket number is 5916015. You got it? Okay. Thank you. All right. The, the next prize we've got here is a Merlin Solar Puff. It is a solar powered lighted light cube. Um, ticket number 5916051. Got one? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, moving quickly, trying to go in a little bit over time right now, so. Good. Okay. Next up, we have a tile combo pack. Um, I have a couple of these, they're pretty handy. You stick them in your wallet and anybody who's running the app nearby can, uh, can uh, tag your lost thing. Uh, the, the ticket number, 5916016. 6016. Got it? Okay, here you go, congratulations, thank you. Okay, next up, the uh, venerable Echo Dot. <laughs> Ticket number 5916032. Got it? All right, great, thank you. Okay. We have a temperature controlled ceramic mug. Let's see here. But does it have Wi Fi? It has Bluetooth. <laughs> Bluetooth enabled coffee mug. All right, number is 5916020. Five nine one six. Zero. All right. Yep. <laughs> I think it's Bluetooth. All right. More. More swag from uh, Amazon. We have an Echo Spot. It's a Echo Dot with a video camera. Ticket number 5916011. Anybody? <laughs> All right. Next up, we have a portable video projector, Dr. J Professional. <laughs> uh, a bit not quite as powerful as that thing, but I'm sure it gets the job done. Um, 5916026. 5916026. So before you announce the last one, you should uh, remind people to vote. Okay. Okay. Um, 
If you haven't voted yet, please do. We're uh, trying to finalize that so we can get, get some winners. Um, the final prize, the Atari Flashback Gold Deluxe. <laughs> so if you're, if you're of a certain age, you remember these games. <laughs> And the ticket number, 5916002. 5916, got one. All right. Great, you need a ticket. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. TV that's round in the back. I'm sorry? All right, so how's our voting? Okay. So we have the top three teams are Cat 5e Hurricane. Uh, Team Buffs, and The Lost Pod. Congratulations, all the teams. Uh, if you could get us all of your contact info so uh, we can follow up later and work on getting uh, slides for the Tuesday presentation, that would be great. Um, thank you, Oracle. Thank you, the DeSudo, and Feeney. We are done. Uh, the reception is is up.